Uh, my name is Johanny Grossman. I'm the team leader of the Green Corruption Program at the Basel Institute on Governance. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, webinar to launch uh, a report uh, called Dirty Deals uh, on uh, Corruption in the Waste Processing and to Trade Space. Um, we have the authors of the report here today and will be fa fascinating discussion, no doubt. Um, I have the chance to moderate the event today uh, and would just like to say a few words um, to kick us off. So the report is part of the Green Corruption Program at the Basel Institute. It's about a four-year-old program uh, that seeks to uh, explore the connections between uh, corruption and the environmental space. And as part of this program, we work in eight countries uh, and provide technical support to government agencies, both on the prevention and enforcement space. Uh, historically, in these four years, that support has focused on the wildlife trafficking, IEU fishing, uh, gold and gold spaces, um, and, um, and deforestation, of course. And we're very pleased with this report to also launch our engagement in the waste trafficking space. Um, this report, um, is launched, has been conducted, and is being launched with the support uh, of our core funder at the Green Corruption Program, the Principality of Liechtenstein. Uh, and we really value their ongoing support, especially in areas that are so under-researched, such as waste trafficking. Uh, there is additional deep dive, so reports in the same series coming out in the next few months. So um, please, uh, if you're interested, we invite you to participate in those discussions as well. I should note that the other deep dives are country focused, so they're country specific deep dives. Um, and we opted to produce a topical report on the waste trade because of its uh, lack of research and lack of public dialogue on the waste trade in general, but especially on its connection with corruption. So this is the only report that's topic specific. And we hope um, that the report and this discussion and subsequent conversations can contribute to raising um, the waste-related corruption from the shadows, which, in fact, the report concludes is one of the reasons why it's so susceptible to corruption. Um, so the format of today's event is that we're going to have the three co-authors present, followed by questions and answers. Um, you will all have the chance to, to raise questions and answer. Please, please use the a Q and A function. Uh, we'll be monitoring those questions and uh, come into them. So before I hand over to the authors, uh, allow me to just briefly introduce them. So our lead uh, technical expert is Nancy Izarin. She is an independent expert uh, uh, in related to to waste uh, management, um, and uh, and has is one of the few people actually who focuses on this continuously. Uh, has brought tremendous expertise to the report, and we're really grateful to have her join um, the 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 conversation. Um, given the fact that we're dealing with a multidisciplinary activity, it's a a group a joint group of authors here today. So we also have uh, Dr. Claudia Bias Camargo, who leads the Basel Institute. Uh, Basel Institute's public governance section and brings the uh, corruption expertise. Um, she um, has been a great partner of the Green Corruption Program on many different reports, and we're very, uh, very much appreciative of our input on this one as well. And of course, uh, Amanda Cabrejo Luru, who is the uh, the lead author of all the deep dive series, the environmental um, crime specialist at the Green Corruption Program. Um, and this, um, um, this dream team of researchers uh, put together the reports and will be presenting its findings. So thank you again, everybody for attending. Uh, I'll hand over to the report, uh, to the authors of the report, uh, starting with uh, Amanda. And then um, I'll come back to you uh, after the presentation for the Q&A, but please um, be so kind and actively participate in the discussion so we have a solid Q&A um, in about half hour's time. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Johanny. Um, so I'm going to start just saying a few words about the context and the methodology we've been applying to this specific report 
and the other um, report in the deep dive series you were mentioning. Um, so I think it's been it's been quite a fascinating work, and we've seen it um, in this experiment and in the other ones. Uh, we're very much um, creating a dialogue between the conservation community or the environmental community and the anti-corruption community. And um, in many cases, nobody is an expert of everything here. So we really need uh, to put around the table um, the different experts to talk together and to learn from each other. So it's very much a, a learning experience. Um, there is a lot of specific terminology um, in both contexts. Uh, there's a lot of specific methodologies, uh, specific frameworks. So to find a way to have those two um, talk to each other, um, and um, and the way we've been um, we've been exploring um, so the topic of really getting a granular vision of how does corruption facilitate environmental crime. This was really our first uh, question, our first broader question, and trying to apply that in different uh, environmental sectors. And also, as we start exploring the waste sector, we realize we also, we also have to go further than waste crime and look uh, more broadly at waste management. Uh, and you will see that the structure of the report um, basically looked at two spaces, um, national waste management challenges versus the world of transboundary movement of waste, which has its own framework and uh, own specificities. And we're trying to find also um, what is specific about um, those two those two aspects of the broader waste sector and what's specific in terms of corruption, corruption risks. And so in terms of methodology, so really the first thing, um, putting together different type of expertise to, to work together and ask questions together. Um, and then um, very much um, the idea of deep dive is deep dive into examples, into case studies. Um, and uh, in, in this report, so there was an initial matrix of cases with 28 cases I identified by colleagues, and then we narrow them down in terms of relevance, feasibility, uh, representing different regions, uh, and trying to, to have patterns and type of issues that were interesting to, to showcase in this report. So at the end of the day, we have five uh, quite fascinating case studies in this report. And in addition to that, also um, an approach in terms of um, risk. So looking at specific stories, specific cases that can sometime help us um, extrapolate and think of broader patterns, but the only five cases, and we also aware of of um, the fact that it's a, it's a small group, um, but also looking at uh, the chain and the business chain uh, and analyzing um, in terms of potential risk. So uh, to, to type of approach in terms of methodology in that sense. And uh, also complemented by interviews that Nancy has been conducting with uh, different actors, different stakeholders, close to um, each of the specific case. And yeah, overall, um, very, very glad to be able to present this report today. And uh, yeah, looking looking forward to, to the discussion. Over to you, Nancy, to present the key findings. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I will, I have prepared a, a few slides, so I will start sharing my screen. Um, Yes, good afternoon, um, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are uh, at the moment. Uh, as I said, my name is Nancy Isarin, one of the co-authors of this uh, Dirty Deals uh, report, uh, and having a background as an environmental investigator and less on corruption. So the multidisciplinary approach uh, was something that we really needed uh, in order to uh, to to uh, develop this report and perform the research. Um, I'm happy to see that there's such an overwhelming interest in this uh, this uh, research and during this short presentation we will highlight 
uh, briefly the context uh, and then followed by uh, some of the case studies that are uh, part of the report. Uh, but first, I would like to take the freedom to thank the Basel Institute on Governance and their uh, donor for creating the opportunity uh, to perform this uh, research, which is uh, a first, uh, I would say, and hopefully more to come, uh, as it's a very underexplored and underfunded um, topic, uh, unfortunately. Um, so starting uh, with, with setting the context, um, and as already said by Amanda, uh, this report uh, tries to bring uh, two completely different worlds together. So on the one hand, uh, the corruption uh, specialists, and on the other hand, uh, the waste management uh, and enforcement community uh, people, uh, which which was already a challenge on its own because everyone had its own uh, skills and experience. Uh, and we had to find a balance on how far and uh, to go with explaining some of the um, uh, international frameworks that are, that are in place, both in relation to uh, waste management, but also when it comes to uh, anti-corruption um, measures. So therefore, the start uh, of the report is uh, describing briefly what is actually waste uh, waste management uh, and what are some of the frameworks uh, that are in place, because those uh, frameworks and provisions set, of course, the boundaries for um, legal uh, treatment uh, and shipment of, uh, of waste. Um, so despite various uh, measures and policies uh, in place, um, to, uh, to, to prevent or to minimize the generation of waste, there is still uh, at the global scale uh, a grow in, uh, in, the, in the generation of waste. And this is mainly due to uh, consumption patterns, uh, economic developments in some parts of the world, but also uh, population growth. So the challenges with waste will, is something that will uh, remain uh, in the near and long-term um, future. Uh, related to this growth uh, of, uh, of, of generation of waste is also the increase of cost to deal with waste in uh, a proper manner. Um, making it lucrative, therefore, to try to circumvent procedures and requirements in place to reduce those costs uh, by making a profit of illegally getting rid of or managing um, waste. Uh, and the impacts of the improper dealing with waste are becoming more and more clear. Uh, for example, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, things are happening now around plastic pollution and plastic waste, which due to uh, unsound management finds its way into waterways, oceans, soil uh, and air, but also uh, in our food chain and even microplastics have been found in our bloodstream. An other side that is important uh, to ensure a good management of waste is that if waste is not properly managed, it is also uh, a loss of valuable resources, as we, as we can see, for example, in electronic and electronic uh, equipment um, that needs to be recycled uh, in order to uh, reuse the precious metals and critical materials that are uh, in those uh, equipments but also the impact on climate change uh, as a result of inefficient recycling and open burning uh, of waste is something that is uh, becoming more and more clear. Uh, also in, uh, in relation to um, waste crime, uh, we see uh, waste crime going beyond the waste trafficking. So indeed, not only the transboundary movement of, of waste, but also um, yeah, illegal activities um, with waste at the domestic level. Uh, and we also start to learn more and more how they are linked with other types of crimes, such as money laundering and fraud. And as it is such a lucrative business, um, coupled with a low risk of getting caught and low sentencing, it also attracts the interest of organized crime groups as a new illicit business model to their existing uh, repertoire. Uh, what we uh, experienced during, the, during this research is that um, uh, little data is uh, is uh, is available. It's either anecdotal or partly available. Uh, and what was mainly available uh, referred to case studies and investigations and research to the role of the uh, of the uh, involvement of Italian maf uh, mafia in dealing um, with waste. Uh, we therefore said we want to try to go beyond that scope and see if we can find other types of of cases uh, in other parts of um, of the world. Uh, we realized that this first research only uh, just scrapes the surface of this matter, uh, and uh, further investigation and research would be uh, would be um, 
needed. So very briefly, an overview of the waste management landscape. Um, also, again, as this is a, a global research, we could not take into consideration uh, any specific or, or national uh, arrangement. So uh, please consider this uh, is just the overall framework, uh, whether it's space, of course, at the national level uh, to organize things uh, slightly different. Um, but at least at the global level, there are some uh, key principles and provisions agreed upon on how to deal um, with waste. Uh, for example, uh, many years ago already uh, uh, by the UN, uh, the Rio principles uh, were agreed upon, which, for example, refer to the polluter pay principle and duty of care. So the responsibility of the waste generator to make sure that the waste it has generated is taken care of uh, also properly further down the, down the chain. Um, the framework, the legal framework uh, with the most global uh, coverage is the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous and Other Waste. Um, and aside from regulating the cross-border movement of waste covered by uh, the scope of this convention, the convention also covers uh, minimization and prevention of the waste ge generation. And it also sets condition on what is considered to be an environmentally sound treatment of, um, of waste. However, um, the Basel Convention does not cover all types of waste, so additional uh, national and regional measures uh, should be in place to deal with other uh, waste categories um, as well. So at the global level, the Basel Convention is there, but uh, to be effective uh, at, the, at the national level, national uh, legislation needs to be in place. Uh, or at the regional level, as we see, for example, in the EU, uh, either through directives uh, in the Waste Framework Directive or regulations such as the Waste Shipment Regulation. Other regional agreements in place are, for example, the Bamako Convention for the African countries uh, and the OECD decision on the control of transboundary movements of recoverable waste uh, for countries that are a member to the OECD. Again, implementing um, those frameworks into the into the national policy framework. Ideally, this should cover the whole waste management chain from collection or separate collection to transport, storage, uh, and the treatment of the waste, whether this is reuse, recycling, recovery, uh, or final disposal by landfilling or incineration. And some of the risks associated with waste uh, are that um, the waste is not being treated as it should be based on its composition, uh, the uh, existence of hazardous characteristics within the waste, uh, potential uh, for recovery, um, and uh, increasing, therefore, the risk of pollution uh, damaging ecosystems or uh, human health. And considering ongoing developments, the, the principles of the waste hierarchy, as is shown on the slide, and circular economy uh, should, uh, of course, prevail. Um, why am I saying this? Because later in one of the cases, you will see uh, how corruption can also undermine some of these basic um, uh, principles, uh, completely uh, dismissing this, uh, this globally accepted um, policy framework for uh, waste management uh, in order to uh, have personal gain. And as Amanda said, the uh, report further then divides uh, kind of the two uh, uh, matters. So the domestic treatment of, um, of waste and on the other hand, uh, the transnational uh, uh, management of waste. Uh, and even though there is some overlap, there are also some, uh, some differences we, we, which we try to highlight in, uh, in some of the schemes in the report. So zooming in on the domestic treatment, uh, in generally we see three main phases, the generation of waste, uh, the collection, transport, and in some cases the trading waste, and third step followed by its, uh, its treatment or interim uh, treatment. And aside from common risks that relate to waste, such as contamination or uh, mixed with, uh, with hazardous materials, uh, there is a special uh, situation uh, for waste generated by household waste, so-called household waste or, or urban waste, as uh, often the collection and the management of this type of waste is the responsibility of either local uh, municipalities uh, or regional or national government agencies. 
which uh, normally in their turn outsource these kind of services to private business operators uh, or organizes in a public private partnership. Um, again, all the actions that relate to, to, to waste uh, may require different uh, levels of control and monitoring. Uh, and in most cases, some type of regulatory measure is in place, uh, either in a form of a permit, uh, registration requirement, or a license uh, issued by a governmental uh, organization or authority. And based on the on the scan or assessment that we, we did, we identified key risk areas um, related to the domestic uh, waste management chain. Uh, first of all, is the, the, the whole tendering uh, and procurement procedures in case of outsourcing the management of, of household waste, the issuing of permits, registration and licenses. Uh, the third part would be on the compliance monitoring and uh, inspection or oversight uh, phase. And in case of breaches or violations of the law, uh, the uh, law enforcement chain, including prosecution and uh, sentencing. So I will go now to the first uh, one of the case studies um, uh, in the reports focusing on the domestic management of, uh, of waste. Uh, this is a case that uh, took place in um, Albania and uh, it started in 2014 with the establishment of an interministerial committee uh, led by the uh, then prime minister and uh, uh, also having five ministers taking part in the uh, committee. Uh, until the, uh, co this committee was established, efforts were in place also with the support of international organizations to promote the waste hierarchy principles, including prevention of waste generation, but also uh, separate collection and uh, recycling of some of those uh, <clears throat> waste streams and specifically uh, household waste. Uh, the committee was first of all not established to conform standing governance uh, procedures, uh, which already uh, was the first uh, um, yeah, sign that something might not be uh, in order. Uh, and then on unknown grounds, this committee announced state of, uh, of emergency uh, in relation to, uh, to the waste management um, within uh, Albania, <clears throat> zooming in on certain uh, bigger cities. And they started a concession procedure to, for a, pi a public-private partnership uh, to build first and later three uh, incinerators. And the aim was to burn waste for energy recovery, uh, letting go of the of the one of the uh, higher up in the waste management hierarchy uh, material recycling principle. Um, Tender procedures were not followed in this case. There was no public announcement and therefore also no uh, competition by other um, bidders. Uh, and this was also mentioned by the National Procurement uh, Agency, but their view and assessment uh, uh, was dismissed by this interministerial committee. Uh, once the contract was uh, uh, awarded, to a company, first of all, this company lacked uh, required experience, but also financial uh, capabilities. Uh, and also the way the contract was designed uh, would raise questions on how normally these contracts uh, would make uh, make sense. For example, uh, payments in, in euros, uh, making the government pay for conversions to the uh, Albanian uh, currency but also change of ownership above 10% in the company should be first confirmed by the responsible ministry, showing uh, the influence that the ministry had in the running of the, of the company. Uh, and we also learned that the person in charge of this company had close links with the political ruling party at the time. So what are some of the impacts and follow-up of this uh, of this case? Uh, a lot of money was uh, embezzled. So public funds that were, were meant to, to, to build these incinerators uh, were funded through a money laundering scheme uh, involving fictitious companies uh, also abroad and, and um, offshore. Um, at, the, at the moment, the incinerators uh, are either operating under capacity or not operating uh, at all. Uh, which means that the waste is being um, landfilled. Uh, also, the promised revenue from burning the waste to energy uh, is not being generated 
making the municipalities pay uh, a lot more for the collection and treatment of the household waste than originally was uh, presented to them. Investigations followed by uh, a parliamentary commission and uh, separately the uh, Albanese Special Anti-Corruption Body, SPAC, uh, and it led to, uh, led to a range of uh, charges uh, ranging from abuse of office, uh, active and passive corruption, uh, laundering proceeds of a criminal offence and uh, fraud. Uh, and this, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the key uh, suspects was um, uh, sentenced, uh, the former Minister of Environment, and he received a jail sentence of eight, uh, six years and eight months. Uh, and a dozen other individuals were also sentenced for their role in this, um, this case. Uh, the owner of the concessionary company is uh, still on the run. So... This is an example of uh, a national domestic case. Um, then I will briefly introduce uh, another case study, which is called the Stericycle case. Um, this one is a bit uh, a weird one in the in the within the report because there is no um, transboundary movement of waste, but there is a transnational structure behind uh, this case study. So uh, I would like to still um, mention it. Uh, under this part of the presentation before handing over to uh, Claudia. So this second example involves uh, a well-organized bribery scheme by a, a US-based waste management company uh, operating globally, uh, having offices also in Brazil, Mexico, and, and um, Argentina. Um, the key uh, source of information for this case uh, were reports and uh, releases by uh, the US Department of Justice, uh, which learned that the company uh, operated sophisticated uh, schemes to issue improper payments and bribes to uh, local officials with the aim to retain their waste business operations and secure advantages. Uh, and it also turned out that this scheme was directed and, and uh, uh, was aware at, at the highest executive level of the, of the company in the, in the U.S., uh, so, for example, they found complete spreadsheets with payments using code words like commission payment or uh, incentive payments for the bribes. Uh, and in order to have access to cash money uh, to be used for the bribes, false and inflated invoices were created uh, for service provided, providers that never provided any of those uh, services. So in 2022, the FBI started an investigation, uh, which led uh, one of the things of the outcomes uh, was a three-year deferred prosecution agreement between the company and the Department of Justice. Uh, the investigation showed that the company earned a profit of uh, more than $21 million uh, and that over $10 million uh, were used to bribe uh, officials uh, in those three uh, countries. So after the case um, yeah, was investigated, uh, as said, there was a three-year deferred prosecution agreement. Uh, sterile cycle were ordered to pay uh, criminal and civil uh, fines, but also part of the agreement uh, was that the company should install an independent compliance monitor within the company enhance their internal compliance program, and for the period of three years, uh, they should uh, self-report uh, uh, to the Departments of Justice on, uh, on the implementation of this uh, compliance program. I think with that, and also looking to the time, uh, maybe I will hand it over now back uh, to Claudia to give her perspective on those two uh, cases. That's okay. Thank you, Claudia. Sure. Thank you, Nancy. Um, just a few remarks uh, in terms of corruption in the domestic management of waste. It has been really interesting to be part of this exercise. One of the things that I learned, or rather this, this, this insight confirmed to me what we know already, that is that no size fits all, right? Context matters and corruption in waste management can happen in many different ways according to the different contexts. So I would really invite the um, participants to have a look at the report so they can see the other cases that will not be covered uh, today for lack of time. Uh, and one of the uh, key insights is that legal frameworks make a difference. 
Um, and uh, if you have a look at the report, the cases of in Lebanon, North Macedonia clearly show how concrete weaknesses in the legal framework opened the door for uh, corrupt activity. I think the stericycle case also is indicative in that it shows how strong and well-enforced legal frameworks, such as the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, in this case, which has um, extraterritorial reach, can be very important in fighting corruption by multinational corporations. So laws are important. I don't need to tell you that. Uh, I also probably don't need to tell you that it's not enough to have good laws, right? Um, uh, even countries where there are good laws, if there are sufficiently powerful interests wanting to uh, go around those laws, of course, this is what we see in cases where state capture uh, is, is a problem or an issue. And, uh, and one has to take into account the political economy. Um, so I, I think taking a step back as somebody who has worked on the field for, of anti-corruption for many years now, um, the waste management sector was not really in my radar so much before. So I just want to underscore how this is not uh, uh, enough understood. Uh, but we have to realize that waste collection, just like we look at corruption in public service delivery, well, waste collection and management is an essential public service. And it's one that commands sizable budgets. So waste is profitable. This we need to understand very clearly. And as such, it's a high risk sector for corruption. And public contracts for waste management are typically very sizable in amounts and therefore public procurement corruption becomes a, um, a, a concern. So I'm going to leave it at that for the sake of time and, uh, and, and, uh, and more topics will come out for the Q&A, but back to Nancy uh, for the moment. Okay, yeah, so I just have a few more words and slides on the uh, on the second part, which is on the uh, corruption risk in the transboundary movement of, uh, of waste and management. As said before, there is some overlap with the domestic management framework, but one of the key differences, of course, is uh, because it's changing uh, uh, or it's moving uh, national borders, there's a change of jurisdiction, uh, but also uh, the involvement of customs and border control agencies uh, is, is something that you don't see at the domestic um, level. Uh, which uh, also impacts the actors in the whole logistic chain uh, by having more actors, of, for example, on customs clearance agents, surveyors, uh, and, and uh, shipping lines. Uh, and in addition to some of those actors to have a permit, license, or registration uh, in place, uh, the Basel Convention requires uh, a special uh, prior informed consent uh, for the waste covered by the Basel Convention uh, following the prior, inf uh, prior informed consent procedure or the PIC procedure. Uh, this often can be a lengthy and costly procedure uh, and particularly the check of the final destination and the treatment of the waste is, is key in this procedure. Um, which uh, make it uh, uh, interesting for some operators or exporters to uh, operate uh, circumventing uh, these kind of procedures just to be quicker and to uh, save uh, spending money for uh, more expensive uh, final treatments. Um, some of the risk areas are, are, are similar as we've seen in the domestic uh, framework, but uh, an additional uh, actor in this field is, as said, the role of customs and border control uh, agencies. Um, what we also see here is uh, the role of surveyors, uh, because there are some importing countries that require a quality check at the side of the exporting country. Uh, this can be independent surveyors or they can act on behalf uh, of their government, uh, being also uh, then uh, a risk in terms of, of uh, corruption um, or bribery. Uh, tendering in this part is, is less relevant, I would say, as this is um, more at the domestic framework. So I will just briefly highlight uh, a case that relates to transboundary movement of waste, which is uh, the Canada-Philippines uh, case study. Uh, where there's alleged corruption in the form of bribery uh, to uh, get import licenses uh, for the waste. Um, <clears throat> it concerns uh, the illegal trafficking of waste from Canada to the Philippines, uh, which started already in 2013. 
And in various batches, a total of 103 containers were illegally shipped uh, from Canada to the Philippines. The content of these containers was declared as plastic waste, which in principle is non-hazardous uh, and consisting of the right polymers, it can be uh, recycled. However, if plastic waste is too contaminated or mixed with other materials uh, or consisting of polymers that cannot uh, be easily recycled, uh, other procedures for import and export uh, uh, can apply. And in the case of the Philippines, an import ban for this type of waste uh, was in place. Um, the quality of the waste, uh, well, was uh, was um, witnessed by uh, customs officials. Uh, some of the containers remained unclaimed in the port. Uh, therefore, they opened up the containers and they saw the actual actual quality of the uh, of the waste, which did not meet uh, importing uh, requirements. Uh, this case shows that despite rules in place for prohibiting uh, imports, customs clearances were um, issued. And following uh, complaints by NGO and civil society, the National Bureau of Investigation, uh, uh, separately from the Ombudsman, started an investigation in 2018. And initially they charged eight officials, uh, four from the Environment Department and four from the Customs Administration uh, for taking bribes to issue uh, customs clearances uh, and uh, import licenses. However, uh, charges against the uh, Environment Department officials were uh, dropped and to our latest information, the case against the customs officials is um, still pending. Uh, looking to the impact of this um, of this case, uh, well, it was a whole political situation uh, where the waste uh, either was not or to be sent back to the country of export. But after five years, uh, most of the containers were sent back uh, to Canada. Uh, but uh, also, it was uh, we found out that twenty six containers or the content of the twenty six containers were disposed of at a private landfill. Uh, which could uh, mean that there was an environmental risk uh, uh, with this type of, uh, of treatment. And the content of eight containers so far has been um, accounted for. We also see that uh, manual border controls uh, by customs uh, are a higher risk uh, uh, compared with digital uh, systems or uh, uh, yeah, documentation, uh, which can uh, help to uh, lower the risk of, uh, uh, of corruption. Uh, this case showed, however, one positive um, impact is that at least the awareness among customs officials on the risk of illegal import of waste um, uh, yeah, has been increased and we've seen that they are now uh, more organized uh, and more aware uh, and willing to control these kind of um, imports of waste. So I will now hand back to Claudia. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. So just very quickly on this case, I, I think this also was a huge eye opener for me. You know, another uh, topic to add to our list of transnational illicit flows that are facilitated by corruption. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's particularly shocking to me because of the lack of awareness that these things happen. But yet, you know, if you have this dirty waste being dumped you know, in perhaps open air and, you know, in, in, in very unethical ways. And the population is not aware of this and yet they will suffer, right? The health and the environmental damage caused by this. So, so I think there's a lot of work to do to raise awareness about these issues. There is a lot to do for improving the international normative frameworks. Uh, as Nancy has explained, we have the Basel Convention, which is a good start, but it doesn't really cover all that, uh, all, all the waste uh, management space, and this unregulated space lends itself to unethical transactions. Um, there's a lot that we could think about in terms of technological solutions to help us detect fraud, for example, in the declarations, uh, uh, to taste waste components, to cross check uh, uh, cargo content with official forms, and so on. I think there's also a lot to be said about thinking from a private sector perspective and some, you know, in the sense of a collective action. Uh, what comes to mind uh, uh, in regards to this case 
is a maritime anti-corruption network who have they have developed a, an incredible whistleblower system uh, working to reduce corruption at the ports. Uh, so that's something to take on as a, as a, as, a, as an inspiration and, and to think how it can be um, made more uh, broader and encompassing. And then uh, last but but not least, I think it's really important to focus on the personnel at the ports, um, trying to find the right mix between controls and incentives, rewarding those who behave with integrity while at the same time improving on the monitoring um, capabilities at the ports. Let me leave it at that and hand it back to Amanda. Oh, right. Thank you. So um, I think, yeah, it's uh, there's so much in this report and I think there's a uh, for for everyone something to to find um we were thinking it would be interesting uh, after presenting the key findings uh to also quickly reflect on similarities and differences with other sectors other environmental sectors uh we are working in um as part of the green corruption team um so i would quickly uh, show a slide um one second here um so i think you can see my slide now right good um so this is part of the conclusion of the report um to um to look at the end of the day what are the types of corruption if we look at corruption patterns um, that emerge from those case studies and from the anal analysis of risks. Um, so I would say the third one here about inspections, about this idea of corruption coming um, and having um, environmental inspectors or border control turn a blind eye to a situation that's not correct. Uh, this is something we can see in the West context, and we can see uh, in very similar ways with uh, illegal wildlife trade, with uh, illegal timber, uh, illegal fishing, um, illegal mining. So this is something that's quite uh, across, goes across the different sectors, definitely. Then I would say the first one, corruption, um, having an influence on the uh, at the very initial at the very um at the level of the design of procedures and policy this is something maybe we don't talk about enough um and we see it emerge in some case studies as as a challenge um and we do see that in other type of issues um it can be i'm thinking mostly of illegal mining. Uh, we've seen situations in specific countries where uh, that type of um, question around state capture can be happening uh, and, and collusion between political elite and, um, and those, those sectors. So that also something we see in other sectors. Um, I'm also seeing further than environmental crime. We're also now talking more and more on cor of corruption and climate. Um, and this is also, there's an emerging discussion um, on, on that aspect and how corruption is also something to discuss uh, at the level of possible influence on uh, policies and even global policies. So there are definitely similarities. Um, then something we're not seeing here in, in our study in the West uh, is corruption and, and the enforcement chain. Uh, this is an issue we're seeing a lot or too much for sure uh, with illegal wildlife trade. Um, in quite a few countries, having this challenge once a case has been detected and a case has started, um, having issues during the investigation phase or uh, prosecution phase or um, adjudicating phase um, of those processes. This is not something we've come across um, in the West case studies. We've rather seen um, very positive responses of the judiciary, for instance, in the Albanian case uh, with uh, the system responding 
uh, well and sanctioning um, those situations. So I would say that that may be one one thing that's different, and definitely the second um, second step identified here um, in this table, procurement. This is something, of course, we're not seeing when we talk about illegal wildlife trade um, and um, and all the type of environmental crime. What we are seeing is definitely an issue around uh, corruption and licenses and authorization. So it can be a license um, to start mining in a protected area. The license should never be granted. And if it's granted because of corruption, um, then from there, all the activity uh, is problematic. Um, so we've seen that in all the sector as something very important, um, corruption and licenses or authorizations. So here it's the problem of procurement. So also this initial contract, this initial document being being a challenge. Um, but what's what's interesting is this question of public contract and procurement uh, is very much a high risk, well known uh, issue for anti corruption specialists. Uh, so in that sense, I would say. Corruption and waste um, is closer to what we can see with the infrastructure sector as a larger sector. So, and Claudia was mentioning also public service delivery. So connecting that, uh, but it's also infrastructure. Uh, every time we need to build roads, um, major public equipment, those big public contracts uh, need to have competitive binding, um, need to have processes with uh, clear oversight and not um, discretion of one individual maybe being able to uh, yeah, take a personal advantage, having um, a huge power in making those decisions. So yeah, just a, a few a few ideas of um, uh, where we we are landing after this long uh, research um, on similarities and differences, um, and definitely ideas of um, what can be done in this sector. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and also thank you, Nancy and and Claudia. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, for questions, and we've had quite an active Q and A uh, stream. Um, and maybe just to start off with a question from Christine, who asks if there are certain types of waste that are more prone to corruption than others. Uh, I wonder if uh, the authors have any thoughts or comments on that. Please, so I, I would say that the, that the current scope of this research was was quite limited, uh, only uh, selecting five case studies. Um, I, I would say that, well, looking only to the case studies, of course, household waste is a, is a, is a risk, but um, also waste with a negative value or waste where there is a risk that it easily can be mixed with, with hazardous uh, materials uh, would be uh, at higher risk. So uh, waste where there is a uh, negative value or where there are relatively high costs to uh, to manage it in a proper way. I would, but I at the moment, I think it's too soon or too early to already name some specific um, types of waste uh, as, the, as the research was too limited. And so. um, another question we got um, is from Maeve, um, who asks about the role of fines and assets claimed on the back of corruption and waste management prosecutions. This is, of course, an, an evergreen question for us at the Basel Institute, given that uh, a significant share of our work relates to asset recovery and, and a topic we have been uh, very interested in on the green corruption team. Um, I imagine, well, I'd, actually, I don't know. Let me ask the authors if there have been any cases like that. Uh, and if not, maybe you can share your thoughts about how relevant those could be. I don't know of any cases where, you know, a, a, a law enforcement investigation led to recover assets from stolen assets through uh, from waste uh, corruption. But I do know of cases where the um, waste corruption management has been improved the um, opportunity space for corruption has been decreased, thereby freeing up significant pool of resources for the municipalities to invest 
in public services and making the communities aware of this and how, you know, it, it's making these clear links between reducing corruption matters for you because it results in a better equipped school, in more health facilities, etc. So I think that, that, that that's, that's a clear link that I see. If I just may... Uh... Add to that a little bit. I know uh, maybe uh, one or two cases that I personally am aware of where uh, where where this this happened. So where uh, there was uh, asset recovery took place uh, uh, in the case of uh, cases of waste crime. However, uh, to calculate the 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 economic damage done on on environment or human health is another challenge so how do you calculate the the financial impact of of the damage done or as a result of the waste crime that is still um also a very uh, unknown area there have been attempts to calculate uh, for example if a certain amount of waste has been uh, improperly managed uh, what has been the impact on on air on the on the soil on water uh, and on human health and how can you give a value to that but that is still also very uh, very early stages uh, and in terms of asset recovery i only know of a very few cases Thank you, Claudia and Nancy. Um, we have a, a further question from, or, or, or comment, I suppose, that might be worth um, raising here in this discussion as well from, from André, um, who notes that uh, many recipient countries do not have engineered and certified landfills, although countries of origin and recipients claim on relevant documentations that they do. Um, and that sort of that disparity makes me wonder if there is a particular corruption risk here that might be worth discussing a little bit more. I don't know if colleagues have some thoughts on this. I can only say something on the not on the corruption uh, risk related part, but on the lack of uh, communication between importing and exporting countries. And uh, uh, indeed, it's it's a challenge for exporting countries to verify the final destination of the waste and to get good information on where is it actually going to, uh, how is it treated, and if that uh, site or or facility has all the uh, correct procedures in place and controlled landfills uh, are indeed. Um, yeah, they're not everywhere yet uh, at, the, at the receiving end. So it's a challenge and uh, there's something, there's also room for improvement there. Uh, we have not, or I have not linked it yet to increased risk for uh, corruption. So I don't know if Claudia has anything to add on that. I mean, not, not, not really from my direct experience. I suppose what I can say is that it seems to me where, that where, you know, properly regulated landfills are not in place, where, you know, dumping of waste is taking place in a rather chaotic way and so on. This, of course, opens the, 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 the space to, to put on top of that, you know, uh, unethical disposal of waste by actors, whether domestic or even transboundary. I think the question is, to the extent that you have less regulation and less ability to enforce a monitoring, then, you know, ironically speaking, you might have less corruption, right? Because the, the, those who are trying to un, unethically get rid of the waste do not even need to bribe. <laughs> so then you, we might have like a kind of curve where you st start strengthening the, 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 the legislation and you might see an increase in corruption because now it's becoming more difficult for those, um, you know, unethical waste dumpers to follow, continue to doing so, and they might resort to bribery and so on. So maybe there's like a U, inverse U-curve there, um, corruption-wise. Um, maybe the final question, as we're about to run out of time. Uh, so there was a question from Isatu related to traceability um, and whether traceability might be a, a solution. That's, of course, a, a question that's asked in, in a number of the other sectors that we work in as well, including timber, fish, and, and wildlife products. Um, so given the given the often negative value, I'm curious what the authors think about the potential of traceability as an anti-corruption or at least transparency measure. Nancy? <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, uh, I, I do it from the more the environmentally uh, management side of things. Of course, we would uh, it would help to increase the traceability and transparency, uh, and especially to, to be able to follow more and better 
uh, where waste is generated and where it ends up uh, maybe at the other side of the globe. <clears throat> uh, the thing is that uh, Basel Convention procedures only cover certain uh, categories of waste and there's a lot of waste being shipped outside the scope of the Basel Convention. For example, non-hazardous plastic waste. Um, uh, and the question is indeed, uh, are the risks high enough to also uh, start introducing some type of control mechanisms for, for, for these types uh, of waste, maybe less stringent than for hazardous waste. Um, but uh, there could be a discussion if we want to see, to increase the, uh, the traceability also of this kind of uh, transboundary movement of waste. Um, uh, yeah. I would say there are some arguments uh, for that. And the only thing that I would like to add is that, yes, of course, we could think in this direction, traceability, but I think we should also be thinking in the direction of preventing. And actually, you know, I think that is a shared goal globally. We need to reduce waste, right? And we need to be able to manage our waste better. So I think that we should also be thinking in terms of incentives, you know, and this go all the way down to the household level and how people deal with their waste, right? And, uh, and, and I, I don't think that we have enough time to go into examples, but simple things just like, you know, having households pay a, a, a small nominal fee for each bag of waste can go a long way in incentivizing people to really reduce, um, uh, separate, recycle, and so on. And that would also, of course, help. Uh, with the overall waste um, um, landscape. All right. So we're coming uh, to the end to the end of our allocated time. Um, I wanted to really thank uh, the three authors of the report. I know it's been a, a tremendous effort. Uh, certainly, the scope and the scale and the complexity was far greater than originally anticipated. Uh, and in a way, getting the genie back in the bottle was not an easy exercise. So thank you. Um, thank you for the three of you for, for your concerted efforts um, in this regard. Um, we, I, I, before we close, I wanted to also thank the, the participants. Uh, we hope that this first engagement in this space is not the last, and we, we invite you to reach out to us and to engage with us in case you're interested in collaborating. Uh, and to also make a short announcement that we have a number of public events coming up before the end of the year. Uh, including a, a plenary of the Practitioners Forum on Environmental Corruption, um, which we have co-founded together with, um, with Traffic, Transparency International, and WWF, uh, and which brings together practitioners who work in the space of tackling corruption in the environment, so the, a small but growing and hopefully influential group. Um, there's a number of site working groups, but also a large plenary focused on preventing corruption in the environmental space that's taking place next week. Uh, and then we also have a number of events uh, on the side uh, at the Conference of State Parties of the UN Convention Against Corruption, which this year is being held uh, in Atlanta in the United States. Um, but the side events focused on environmental corruption uh, are available online and you're able to, to register and participate in them through that medium. So uh, this just leaves me to thank everyone for their participation. Uh, I wish you a good uh, rest of your day, depending on what or evening or morning, depending on what time zone you're in, uh, and look forward to welcoming you again at a future uh, deep dive presentation and our other events. Thank you very much. <laughs>